tēnā koto katoa, um, e te mana whenua tēnā koto, um, no Canada, no Toronto, aho, ko Ontario te moana, no Ingarangi a Kutupuna, ke ototahi o e noha ana, he arohangi matai henengaro o e te whare wananga o Waitaha, ko Julia Rackledge taguingua, no reira, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tato katoa. A very uh, warm welcome to you tonight. I am thrilled. It's so exciting to see so many people passionate about the role of nutrition in mental illness. Um, I'm always astounded when I see that lineup outside about, you know, really, is there going to be anyone who's going to come and listen to this talk that you see on a cold night? Um, but there's, there's definitely the will is there. And um, it's really exciting that hopefully this will signal that things are going to change. So before I start, well, I guess I'm supposed to tell you there's some toilets outside. Uh, if there's an earthquake, drop, drop. <laughs> and uh, go outside. I'm sure there'll be people who will lead you to go somewhere. Um, and I'm really sorry if you were thinking you were going to get out of here by 8 o'clock. Uh, my apologies. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm, we're starting late. So, but if anybody does feel they need to leave because you've got babysitter, then you know I won't be offended. Just I guess you know, quietly go out. And also because we have so many people, we're also being live streamed um, through Facebook that there's going to be a, hopefully opportunity for questions at the end. And I'm happy to stay for, you know, a reasonable amount of time. I do want to go to bed at some point. Um, <laughs> but I will provide you with some links, uh, some emails, so that you can find out more about what we do at the University of Canterbury. So for those of you, has anybody heard me speak before? Yes, OK, I've got some fans in here. That's good. That's good for, for those of you who haven't heard me speak, that they're coming back. Must have been OK. So um, I, just to, to clarify, um, I have absolutely no commercial interest in any company or the sale of any product. Very important. I'll talk about my uh, sources of funding at the end of the talk. And it's also important to have, know that there's a disclaimer, and that is that I don't believe that nutrition is the only thing that's relevant to mental health, although that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. There is um, many other things. If we could just um, uh, re reduce poverty and stop, uh, reduce the number of adverse events that children are exposed to during their childhood, we would honestly go a long way to solving the mental health crisis. I really believe that there are some substantial, significant social factors that are contributing to the um, expression of mental illness in our community. You should recognize this place, South Island. There's about 950,000 people who live on this island. And that is a fifth of the population of New Zealand. And that also represents the number of people in New Zealand who are currently struggling with a mental health issue in any one given year. One fifth of the world population struggles from a mental illness like bipolar disorder, ADHD, depression, psychosis. It affects all of us. So in this room, how many of you know of someone, a friend or a family member, who suffers from a mental illness? Everybody. And how many of you feel that conventional treatments have resolved their problems? Okay. <laughs> All right, are there any politicians here? Anybody who works in the DHB in the public health sector? And nobody, nobody? Oh yes, there's some, okay. So 
I think this, I, I've asked that question of audiences over and over again, and I get that same response. Now, I appreciate you're probably a biased audience. You're interested in nutrition. You've come here probably because conventional treatments haven't worked. But I do, I ask this of every audience, and I get the same response every time that most people are dissatisfied with what we are currently doing. Internationally, over the last few, uh, two decades, there's been a threefold increase in ADHD, a 20-fold increase in autism, and a 40-fold increase in bipolar disorder in children. If we look locally, based on the New Zealand Health Survey of 2017, there's been almost a tripling of the number of problems that children are suffering from in terms of psychiatric illnesses. If we look at the adult data from the New Zealand Health Survey from 2006 to 2016, what we see is an increase of 56% in the reports of mood problems and a doubling, over a doubling of problems when it comes to anxiety. We're able to look at that in terms of population of percentages. 5% would fall into the severe range in any one given year, 9% in the moderate, and 7% in the mild. Now, you hopefully recognize this city. There's a population of Christchurch is about 400,000 people. And that represents the number of people in our community who are currently not receiving any psychiatric help for their problems. I call this the optimistic treatment gap. So let that sink in. 400,000 people, that's almost half of the number of people who are in need of services, are getting nothing. So, one of the things that we think about in terms of why is there such a treatment gap we need to look at the workforce. And there are about 3,000 psychologists registered in New Zealand currently. That is one psychologist for every 312 people. If we look at clinical psychologists, there's about 1,500 registered. And they're the ones who probably need to deal with that 5%, which means that actually, in terms of the numbers, they could only see at most two to three percent of the population if we're looking at that severe range. So that's the number of people they can see in any, any one given year in terms of just acknowledging that one psychologist can probably see between 60 to 80 people. If we think about other allied health professionals and we add in nurses and we add in um, psychotherapists and other mental health professionals, then we can probably double that and then that is leaving us with that treatment gap of about 40% of the population. So we just recently had a mental health inquiry, and probably, hopefully, you're all familiar with us, and there was a report that was given to the government just at the end of last year. And there were 40 recommendations, including more options for talk therapies, and an increased access to psychotherapy beyond the most severe cases, and they said the lack of avail available services, especially talk therapies, was blamed for much of the perceived ineffectiveness and inefficiency of the current system. And so the proposed solution was to increase the workforce. So they, want, they say if we can just have more talking therapies, then we can address this absolutely massive problem and address the treatment gap. Now, as a clinical psychologist, and I train clinical psychologists at the University of Canterbury, we graduate between 10 to 12 students per year. So nationally, we graduate about 60 clinical psychologists. If we consider that there will be, of course, other health professionals uh, um, graduating as well, we might increase that number to increase the workforce 800, maybe 150 people per year. If the government put a whole bunch of resources into increasing internships 
and uh, increasing the number of students the university can take, we might optimistically be able to deal with the treatment gap by 2040, okay? So let that sink in. And let's reflect and think, really, is the, the primary recommendation that was made by the mental, by the, from the Mental Health Inquiry was to increase talk therapies. Can we realistically, as a community, actually achieve that? And it's not that I'm against the training of clinical psychologists and that they do a great job. Of course they do. They help a lot of people. But what I'm challenging the government to think about and for us all to think about is whether or not this is the best way to address and reduce the burden of mental illness in our community. And meanwhile, what we are doing is because of the lack of resources, we have an over-reliance on medication. And so if you look at our public health care system, it is built on a medical model. And that means that medications are the frontline form of treatment, followed by psychotherapy and other forms of support. So this reliance on medications is evident from the increasing rates of prescriptions. So if we look at Pharmac data, over a 10-year period, there was a 48% increase in the number of people on antidepressants and a 40% increase in the number of people on antipsychotics. That means that about a half a million New Zealanders, which is 13% of the adult population, are currently taking an antidepressant. Now, these treatments do save lives, and many people benefit from these medications. But what I do want us to think about is that if the rates of mental illness are going up and the number of people on disability as a direct consequence of having an underlying psychiatric disorder is going up, then is this solution of putting people on medications really the best way forward? because if it was truly working over time, we should see a decrease in the number of people with psychiatric problems, not an increase. And if we look at any class of medication, we look at stimulants, we look at antipsychotics, we look at antidepressants, anxiolytics, the pattern is absolutely the same. In the short term, these are very effective treatments, but in the long term, too often they aren't and in some cases, they're making life worse. If we look at studies um, looking at ADHD, in the short term, it's a very effective, the stimulants are a very effective way forward. But this study that came out is long term, looking at 16 year data. And not only does it show that the kids who stay on medications over that long period of time are doing no better than the kids who never were treated with these medications despite having ADHD. But those children are two to three centimeters shorter as a consequence of being on that medication. Another study found that despite an ever-increasing use of antidepressants, recovery rates, and relapse rates are no better now than they were 50 years ago before the advent of medications. Further, a recent study that just came out uh, this year showed that more than half of people who attempt to come off of antidepressants experience withdrawal, and half of those report it to be severe. People who are randomized to stay on antipsychotic medication are less likely to recover in the long term from schizophrenia as compared to people who are randomized to have their dose reduced or completely eliminated. And there are more and more studies that I could show you painting the same bleak picture. I am not convinced anymore that we can reduce and solve the mental health crisis in our communities simply by doing more of the same. 
as they said in the report, we can't medicate or treat our way out of the epidemic of mental distress. So is there a better way? I, want, I think it's time for us to revisit a very old idea. So the brain accounts for 2% of our body weight, but it requires between 20 to 50% of glucose and nutrients. And one liter, I want you to think about this when you think about what you eat for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, when you're reaching for a snack, that one liter of blood enters your brain every minute. And that's 60 liters of blood every hour your heart is beating. And you need to think about what is it doing. And ultimately, is a diet that consists of soft drinks, processed food, low in fruits and vegetables, adequately going to meet the needs of your brain. And so I want you to think about food in a different way. We often think about food in respect to its macronutrients, the carbs, the proteins, and the fats. But what I'm going to focus on today and tonight is going to be thinking about micronutrients, and that is the minerals and vitamins that are contained within nutrient-dense food and how important they are for our brain health. What are micronutrients? They're required in small amounts and they're essential for the production of enzymes, hormones, and neurotransmitters. So what I did was I put together some data and I looked at different types of foods that we eat. And I've, what I've done here is I've graphed them according to their micronutrient content, and by no means have I been able to cover them all. I just couldn't fit them all into a graph. And then I've put it in terms of relative to RDA, the recommended dietary allowance. Now, I'm not a massive fan of RDA, and I'll explain that later, but at least you get a sense of whether or not you're going to help yourself avoid getting rickets or scurvy by eating um, different types of food. So you need to, you want to get to at least 100%, but it goes off, some of them go off the chart. So if we look at kiwi fruit, amazing. Vitamin C, great source of vitamin C, and some other nutrients. Strawberries, you get some, uh, you know, a, other range of vitamins. Apples, not so good. There's probably an issue to do with storing and transportation that I'll talk about later. Brussels sprouts, any lovers of Brussels sprouts here today? There are some. Fantastic. You are doing your brain a lot of sir, good service. There we go. Yes, there's a reason why your mother and your father told you to eat, your, and your grandparents told you to eat Brussels sprouts. Salmon, not too bad. We get more minerals there. Steak, we get some good minerals and a range of vitamins. Kale. Kale, anybody here like kale? Cheap and nourishing. Watch this. Look at that. Lots of nutrients in kale. A colleague of mine is so into kale that he created International Kale Day. And <laughs> believe it or not, believe this one or not, he wrote a book that's called 50 Shades of Kale. <laughs> Brazil nuts, great source of selenium. Five Brazil nuts will get you a good, your good dose of selenium. Important, because we're deficient in selenium. Um, donuts, didn't do so well. <laughs> Hot dogs, watch it. Oh, not much in there. English muffin, fortification brings that up a little bit. And the last one, are you ready? Coca-Cola, okay, ready? Do you want me to do that again? <laughs> Okay, but in all seriousness, a quarter of calories of our adolescents come from fizzy drinks. So they are drinking something that is energy rich and nutrient deficient, okay? Important, because we know that's where it's so important to get good nutrients during adolescence, as well as other times, other periods of life. So you've gotten a bit of a flavor about why I like micronutrients. But I want you to understand why it's so relevant to your brain. And some people are pro hopefully here are familiar with neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin. And I just want to show you the pathways to making dopamine. And some of the enzymes that are required, those are all enzymes, 
um, that are required in order to convert one chemical to another and eventually make dopamine. So look at this. This is why this is what's relevant. Look at these cofactors that are required in order for dopamine to get made. You need magnesium, you need vitamin C, you need zinc, you need B6, you need folate, you need copper. So you need a range of nutrients in order to make dopamine. Now let's look at serotonin. We know this is very serotonin is very important for mood regulation. But B6, we need copper, we need iron, we need molybdenum. And so then we need to pause again and think, will that diet provide you with those nutrients that are important for the production of neurotransmitters that we know are essential for regulation of emotion? And then if we look at that in a bigger picture, what we see here is that that is, what I just showed you was that little bit there in terms of serotonin production. So then look at all the other pathways that are in all of these chemical reactions that are occurring in your brain to make these very important chemicals. And we need those micronutrients in order for this to function effectively. So the obvious solution, hopefully, you're thinking, is why don't we just all eat better? Yeah? Yes. Apparently that's hard to do. But the epidemiological studies are all showing that the more you eat a Mediterranean style diet, and that's a diet that's high in fish, it's high in fruits and vegetables, high in nuts, and low in processed food, the lower your risk for mental illness. And there's been um, a dozen, dozen of these types of studies that have been conducted around the world all showing the same thing. And there's also been studies that have shown that the more you eat a diet that's high in processed foods, high in sugary drinks, high in takeaways, and low in fruits and vegetables, then the greater your risk for problems, for mental health problems. So if we look at um, nutrition as a risk factor for problems and challenges in, um, over time in terms of uh, infant development and children. What we know is that women who are malnourished during pregnancy have a higher risk of producing offspring who develop schizophrenia and depression. We know that the Western diet during pregnancy and early years of life increases the risk for offspring developing depression, anxiety, ADHD, and other behavioral problems like aggression and tantrums. And diets poor in quality during pregnancy or high in sweets, refined grains, high energy drinks, fats, oils, and fast foods are significantly associated with symptoms of antenatal depression, anxiety, and stress. And a healthy dietary pattern, which includes fruit, was associated with lower depression scores during the antenatal period and cognitive enhancement in the offspring. So not only do the studies show us that what we're eating is associated with mental health problems, but we know how important it is for the mothers to eat well during pregnancy in order to decrease the risk and the chances that her offspring are going to have psychological problems. It's, an, it's imperative that we start to really pay attention to that early life and how we can get people onto a better start. There have now been studies that were published over the last year that show that we can manipulate diet. And in, in, in so doing, we can reduce symptoms associated with depression. This study randomized people to a diet intervention versus social support in people who had depression and who were eating poorly. And they found that 32% of those who were randomized to the diet intervention went into remission in their depression versus 8% in the control group. And then this uh, study was replicated by another group um, in Adelaide who showed the same thing, where they, they looked at um, people who were on a Mediterranean diet versus a social support group. And you see much greater reduction in those who had been randomized to have dietary intervention versus having social support. So there is this a lot of rich data that's actually telling us, and I've just been able to show a, a few of those studies, that are showing us that what we eat is very relevant to our mental health. 
And those epidemiological studies, just to clarify, they're not only done cross-sectionally, but they're also done over time, longitudinally, looking at how diet at time one can predict your mental health at time two down the road, four, five, seven years later. But eating better is a really good thing, but there are some reasons why we think at the Mental Health and Nutrition Research Lab at the University of Canterbury, why probably we need, for some people, they may, may need more nutrients than what they can get out of their diet alone. One of them has to do with the way we select food. We're selecting food that stores well, transports well, looks pretty, but we never select our food best based on how nutrient dense it is. We don't remineralize our soils adequately. We're not putting in essential trace elements. So we, our soils are getting depleted over time. We use things like Roundup, glyphosate, which we know actually reduces the nutrient density of the plants. There's really interesting, intriguing research showing that. Climate change, the increase in carbon dioxide has been now shown to reduce the density, the nutrient density of plants. And then there's our individual factors. Our genetics can increase our vulnerability for mental illness, but it could also increase the likelihood that we don't be, we're not able to utilize nutrients that we do get out of our food as effectively as someone else who isn't vulnerable to, towards mental illness. The health of our gut, we're hearing a lot about the health of the microbiome and the bacteria in our gut and how important they are in, um, in digesting the food, but also in terms of absor being able to assist in the absorption of nutrients and ensuring that our brain is adequately nourished. It all starts in the gut. And so some people who have inflamed and unhealthy guts, that will influence whether or not you can uh, absorb nutrients even if you're eating a healthy diet. And the mitochondria, which are in every single one of our cells and are essential in the production of energy and that allow us to do everything that we do, we now know that the mitochondria, if they don't, they're not well fed and they're not, they don't receive nutrients and adequate micronutrients, that impairs their ability to function. And so that may play another role in terms of why some people um, may need more nutrients. So all of these factors could result in fewer nutrients available to support brain health. So then the question becomes for our lab and for other researchers is should we then consider supplementing with micronutrients, that is vitamins and minerals for some, and if so, should we take a single nutrient approach or a multiple nutrient approach? And you've all probably heard about the magic nutrients like vitamin D or um, you might hear about iron or magnesium and that people will, or zinc, and they think, if I just take that, find out what that magic nutrient is, then all my problems are going to be solved. And I'm going to say, I think you're looking for the wrong thing. That magic bullet probably doesn't exist with some few exceptions. These are some of the exceptions that we have identified a few deficiencies that are associated with some psychiatric illnesses. Like thiamine, we know it contributes greatly to Wernicke's encephalopathy. Or niacin, um, the fortification of foods with niacin or B3 completely eradicated pellagra, which was a skin disorder that also led to psychosis. Or B12, we know that people who are deficient in B12, it can lead to psychosis of pernicious anemia, and then people who are deficient in iodine may suffer from myxedemia madness. So, but overall, more likely, you're going to have a multiple number of deficiencies. And we know based on data, this is American data, but you could do the same thing with New Zealand data. That the most the populations across the board are deficient in new, they're not getting adequate nutrients from their food. They're showing deficiencies across the board. And so if we think about the um, single nutrient approach, and we think about that real, like with respect to an analogy with a dam, and we just decide, okay, well, we're gonna plug up that one hole with that magic nutrient, you're just gonna create another problem. And so it's not until we give the broad spectrum of nutrients that maybe we're going to see some major inroads. And that's where our work comes in. Now this work, just to understand the background to it, 
it stems actually from some families from in southern Alberta, Canada, who thought they could treat mental illnesses with nutrition, and they decided to treat really serious psychiatric disorders, bipolar disorder, psychosis, depression. And, um, you know, we know, like my training anyway in clinical psychology had taught me that only medications or psychotherapy could treat these um, very serious conditions. But they, um, some researchers uh, like Bo Professor Bonnie Kaplan, my PhD supervisors and others, pr um, published some preliminary data in the early part of this century showing people getting well and staying well with nutrients. And so I thought, hey, you know what? That's a really interesting idea. I'm a scientist. We are the critics and conscience of society. And we are supposed to study ideas that are controversial and contravene our current way of thinking. How are we going to progress if scientists don't do that? So I just thought, hey, this is going to be really easy. I'm going to start doing some research. And it's been an interesting 10 years. I don't have the time to go into how, how difficult it's been um, and what a difficult road it has been. But I'm really delighted to have gone on this journey. And I'll share with you why. So in terms of the evidence for broad spectrum, what is in a bar? It's nothing magical. Here's what's in there. There's some nutrients, there's vitamins, there's minerals, there's maybe some amino acids. But it, the key, I think, we think, is that they're often at doses higher than RDA but lower than the UL. Really, really important to appreciate that one. So if we look at the micronutrient safety, I often hear, you probably have heard some of these rumors that micronutrients kill you. Has anybody seen that in the media? No? Vitamins? Expensive urine? Oh, it's like, it just, it's nonstop. I constantly feel like I'm battling. But in fact, micronutrients are incredibly safe if you don't take mega doses, and that is doses way above what's called the upper level, and if you take them in balance with each other, because that's really important, they work together. So if you take zinc without copper, you'll create a copper deficiency. But if you take them together, you won't have that problem. So we need to understand that importance of putting them together. If you saw those, those graphs about serotonin and dopamine, it's not just one. We need them all. And if you only give one, you're going to create deficiencies in others. So in our research, we are giving the micronutrients typically above the RDA, but t and also typically be below the UL. And the UL actually identifies a level where there isn't any evidence of toxicity. So it, you need to go up, up much above the UL before there's any evidence of toxicity. And sometimes that might be that if you take too much magnesium, does anybody know what happens? Diarrhea. Yeah. That's toxic, right? I mean, that's not a great, <laughs> great effect. But that's where, that's the, that would be the side effect associated with magnesium. If you take too much niacin, what you'll get is a flushing. You'll get a flushing re response. It's not that you're going to keel over and die. It means that you might end up with a side effect, which for some people could end up being a problem. And it would be really important that you didn't take it at that level for an extended period of time. So that's where we're working. We're operating there. And we wonder whether that's the therapeutic range. In our research, we give people more than what you'd get out of a supermarket pill. Do not take away my, the, you know, the information I've shared with you tonight and think you can just go and bet, get a one a day and that that is going to solve all your problems or the problems of your family or your friends or your mother and your father, your children, whatever. Because we gave, we give in our, our studies up to 12 pills a day with a broad range of vitamins and minerals. Um, and it's unlikely that if you went and got a supermarket pill, you would either be able to replicate the dose or the breadth, or even um, in terms of how well they absorb. Um, and so, and they've never been tested from what I know. So 12 pills a day, if you have uh, people who can't swallow pills, there's been a, a, pill, a, a, a video that's been developed to help people swallow pills. And then there's, what I, what I want to share with you is how important it is in terms of the scientific process and how we develop evidence. And we have this pyramid of evidence in medicine where we start with maybe some case reports. We, we saw one recently. We heard of one recently in the last couple of weeks, not in this area, but in a totally different field. And it was an HIV. 
It was one case report, and it was reported all around the world, of a guy who was cured for his HIV. Did everyone, anyone hear that one? Yeah. That was one case, not a randomized control trial, not a case series. It was one case. But it was so important that it's probably going to lead to a lot more research. So with our research, it started with one case. It's, that, and it's a case where you go, you know, you get kind of almost, you give it a shot. And you say, okay, here's some nutrients. No idea if it's going to work. Let's observe your psychiatric symptoms over time. And that for me is patient zero. And patient zero was someone who I had been working with for years and years as a psychologist making almost no impact whatsoever in his OCD symptoms. And he started micronutrients. And within two weeks, his OCD was gone. I kind of paid attention. And I thought, this is worth studying. And that's where it all started. So case reports, case series, case control, cohort, randomized control trials, and then systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So when it comes to what we've done and published over the last 10 years, We've been a little bit busy. This is some of the, just a sample of some of the publications that we've put out in our lab. We've done the case studies. We've done the case control. We've done case series. We've done randomized control trials. We've done follow-ups. And we're now doing systematic reviews. What do we know about this approach in terms of the number of studies that have been done and published, not just in my lab, but around the world? If we look at aggression, there's been six randomized control trials. There's been three in autism. There's been seven uh, in, in terms of reduction of stress, three for ADHD, 14 for mood. Common theme is, a, uh, is regulation of emotion, lowering irritability, managing anger. Now, when you see that, you think, oh, that's not that many. But just appreciate that when it comes to a drug, the drug only needs two positive randomized control trials in order to get FDA approval. You can have 10, 15, 20 negative trials. If they have two positive ones, they do get FDA approval. So it is, um, I mean, I've done my best to try to get this, um, uh, this approach funded in New Zealand. I've failed so far. I have applied to Pharmac as an independent individual, applying on behalf of people who have been helped in our studies. So they just said we didn't have enough research. So we're going to keep going. Um, some clinical, they have some non-clinical populations. Ingredients and doses across the world do vary, and this is a bit of a problem that I'll talk about. And I also want to emphasize mostly unmedicated. In my lab, entirely unmedicated. And that's because we think that at those levels, there are interactions with medications. And it's important for you, if anybody takes this information and wants to apply it, that they need to think about the medications, particularly the psychiatric medications they're taking, because we do think there might be an interaction. So what have we found? So just to give you a little bit of a flavor of it, just what we've, what we've researched, we looked at the use of micronutrients after the earthquake. We saw a reduction of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms from 65% down to 19% with a one-month intervention with micronutrients with absolutely no, no change in those people who followed treatment as usual, which was medications and or psychotherapy. Even a year later, those people who had been taking the micronutrients in that short term were doing far better than those who hadn't taken micronutrients in that acute situation. We then replicated this work following a flood in, Gen in uh, June 2013 um, in Alberta, Canada. And to me, the message is clear. A well-nourished body and brain is better able to withstand stress and overcome the stress associated with a natural disaster. And it's a cheap and effective way of addressing the mental health issues of a population following that kind of event. ADHD, we published a study a few years ago looking at the impact of um, micronutrients and helping people with ADHD. And we had about 50% of people um, we identified as much to very much improved relative to the placebo, which was around 20%. The exciting thing is that we then replicated that almost that identical effect in children. And this is really important, is replication in science, is that it's not that you saw one in one study. You need to keep doing it over and over again. What I look forward to is replication from other labs. And there's currently a study that's been done in the United States where they're looking at the effects of nutrients on these symptoms. In terms of impairment, the exciting thing is that we improved impairment far more in those people who received the micronutrients over the 10-week to 12-week period relative to the placebo, far greater effect. 
And then we look at them long term, naturalistically. We say, okay, well, what happens after you leave the lab? And what we, I show here is, first of all, how they're doing at the beginning, how they do at the end of what we call our open label phase, and then what happens naturalistically. And what I, I divided them up to, into was their sort of main treatment at, at one year. And we can, usually this is pretty um, typical. We'll see they either stay on micronutrients and about 20% of them, and that's usually because of cost. Um, mentioned that problem with Pharmac. Number two is they might switch to medications because medications are free. And number three is they stop everything altogether. And so what we see is that those who stay on them, they do well and they stay well. And then those who um, stop, reverse, and then those who switch to medications, they're a group of people who didn't do as well. They definitely got better, but not as well. And they don't get any better when they switch to medications, which is intriguing. What's even more intriguing is that we've just looked at this in our child data, and we've just, these are, da these are uh, data that have not pu been published, and we see the almost the identical pattern in the kids, that about 20% of them stay on, and when they do well, they stay well. And that if you go on medications, it's a little bit of a different pattern. There's a little bit of improvement, but they're nowhere near as good as those kids who are on micronutrients. If you stop, you get bad, worse, and then this is the group of kids we couldn't follow. Smoking. Smoking's a big issue. We need to, you know, by 2025, apparently it's going to be smoke-free. I really hope one day that people pay attention to this amazing study that was published by Pip Rehana, who um, just p finished her PhD. Um, and is going to be graduating in April um, and, uh, with her doctorate. And what she did was that she um, first did a baseline to assess the people who were smoking, find out how much they were smoking, and then she did a pre-quit phase where she randomized people to micronutrients or placebo for four weeks, said, just keep smoking, let's see what happens, and then you had a quit day. And at that point, you either continued with the micronutrients, you didn't know you were taking that, and you also got all the services that are, are offered to you through Quitline or um, placebo plus Quitline. And here's her data. She showed that at four weeks, far more, there was a, uh, about 65% of people who were randomized to micronutrients quit, completely quit smoking versus about 40% in the placebo group. At 12 weeks, it doesn't, you know, it goes down. This is sadly the way it goes when it, you're, you're studying this population is that people do keep smoke, they can return to smoking. But it's still much better than the placebo. But what I also want to show you is this. This is the data from the uh, nicotine replacement therapy plus quit line data relative to our data. So you can see that we are actually outperforming NRT and then look at this data. This is looking at Champix, which is currently funded in New Zealand, incredibly expensive. And look at it relative to our, our results. And then look at it relative to our placebo. Same. Do you see that? So we published it. Sadly, we got very little attention um, on this study. And I just really would love, I don't know how you can do it. We want to do a bigger study. There were problems. We had challenges with dropouts. But it was exciting to see this level of um, change. And this just shows you, this is looking at individuals as, in terms of the number of cigarettes smoked um, and, and over time. And what you can see is this is the micronutrient group and the number of cigarettes per day. This is their baseline period. And look at that amazing drop. Um, in the number of cigarettes smokes and you, smoked, and you can see far more variability in the placebo group. But science is messy, and not all trials are positive. And I want you to know that I, I'm not here to just be biased. I don't want you to see me as cherry picking. And there are some negative trials out there using micronutrients. And here's one. This one I looked at um, have very healthy um, uh, uh, psychology students who, if you, a, a Beck depression inventory score of six means you've got absolutely nothing wrong with you. So you always have to wonder what, do they, what are they treating when they do this kind of study, because they are not depressed. And then they found that, well, lo and behold, people got even a little bit better, but there was no group difference. But there's no room for improvement, and there's no opportunity to see group differences. So I just wanted you to know the kind of negative trial that is being done out there. And then another one that was just published this year where they called it more is not merrier. They used a whole bunch of nutrients 
Um, and there was an eight-week randomized control trial. And th with this one, they did use people who, they, they collected a sample of people who had major depressive disorder. And what they um, found, they did the, the thing that's different from our studies is that they used adjunct, it as an adjunct treatment, which meant that some people will still, still on SSRIs. And if we look at some of these ingredients, we know that they, have in, they all have impacts on the serotonergic system. And so combining things like 5-HTP and SSRIs is highly problematic and it can lead to serotonin syndrome, which did happen in their active group. So it worries me when this kind of study comes out and says nutrients don't work, but they actually set it up for failure. But interestingly, despite that, there were no, I mean, there were actually no group differences in their mood. There were 34% of remission for the active, but a higher rate of 40% in placebo. 34% in remission is actually not bad, but they called it a negative trial. I would actually say, is this possibly a failed trial because their placebo rate was so high? I heard this amazing podcast a while ago by Kaylin O'Connor, and I really liked something that she said. She said, we're never 100% sure about anything. But we shouldn't be looking for certainty. Instead, we need to be saying to ourselves, when do we have enough evidence to make good decisions? And I think we need to stop thinking in, in, um, in binary terms and start thinking in probabilistic terms. And I hope what I've shown you already, there's adequate information and data out there that's showing that actually when it comes to psychiatric symptoms and the treatment of psychiatric symptoms, we have a lot of data that is showing that this is probably relevant to good brain health. <coughs> so where's my lab going? Where are we going in the future? What do we want to do? Well, we're going to have to keep collecting data because that's what the government told me I had to do. One day I'll get a it through pharma. But we're also interested in the why and the for whom. We want to know, well, if it does work, who does it work for and why does it work? So we're looking at things like um, biomarkers, we're looking at serum markers, we're looking at the health of the microbiome, we're collecting fecal samples from um, people in our studies to see whether or not that can help us better understand why people develop psychiatric illnesses and also whether your microbiome changes relative, um, as a consequence of receiving micronutrients over, over time. We're interested in genetics to see whether or not we can have epigenetic effects. Can we turn genes on or off with nutrients? We know that um, nutrients can be incredibly powerful in turning genes on or off. And the best example for this is the honeybee. If you think about the honeybee, the honeybee and the worker bee are genetically identical, genetically identical, but phenotypically completely different. The honeybee is fertile and the worker bee isn't. And what is it that makes the difference between the honeybee and the worker bee? The union. Huh? No way. The what? The union. The union, okay. <laughs> well, that, but uh, it could be that. But I was actually thinking of diet and the royal jelly. So <laughs> diet can be incredibly powerful if it can make the difference between fertility and not being fertile. We're interested in looking at the effects of micro, micronutrients on brain function, on the mitochondria, and on inflammation. So these are, things, these are areas of exploration, which hopefully we, hopefully we can answer some questions. Just to let you know about some studies that we're currently doing here at the University of Canterbury. If you want to know more, we've got a couple. I've got some students down here. I have a couple of students down here um, who might be able to provide you with some information on the Nutrimum trial, the Nomad trial. There's the websites. Follow us on, on Facebook. That's where we, we tell people about the results of our, our studies. Um, email the mental health and nutrition at canterbury.ac.nz if you want to know anything more about the nutrients that I have talked about today. You'll notice that I haven't named anything by name, and there's, that's done um, absolutely deliberately. But if you email us, one of my wonderful graduate students will reply. Follow me on Twitter or look at us on ResearchGate. But I wanted to show you this, our micronutrient babies. So we, we're currently running a pregnancy trial. And we're looking at seeing whether or not we can improve the mental health of women who are struggling with depression and anxiety during pregnancy. And I just wanted you to see some of the healthy babies um, that have been born from that study. So here's that. I showed you this at the beginning. 
So with all, this is our con current conventional medicine. This is our current approach. But with all of these rich data highlighting the power of nutrition, can we rethink our current treatment approach? Can we prioritize lifestyle factors, address inequality, address trauma, healthy eating, exercise, supplements when required, use psychotherapy if those things don't work, and then medications ultimately if these approaches are not capable of making the differences that we're hoping for. If nutrients work, then could there be a day when these nutrients are covered through our public health care system? We need to get politicians on board to effectively change our current funding system that rewards treatments that are generally patentable. Vitamins are minerals are not patentable, and I think that is one of the primary problems here. What would the long-term rates of mental illness be if nutrients and nutritious food were our medicine? And then look at the, new, the inquiry. It was, nutrition was mentioned seven times, and nutrients were never mentioned as part of our solution to go forward for addressing the mental health crisis. Randomized trials in the 18, 1600s showed that putting limes aboard ships completely eliminated the 40% mortality from scurvy, but it took 264 years for the British government to mandate that all ships must carry citrus for their sailors. So how long is it going to take our society to pay attention to the research that's showing that suboptimal nutrition is contributing to our epidemic of mental illness? There are many examples in history where we have been very slow to change. Consider Pythagoras, who suggested that the world is round. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who has suggested that our environment can influence our genes. John Harrison, who, showed that, who identified that building a, a clock can help us with determining latitude. Or Ignis Semmelweis who suggested that we should wash our hands before touching pregnant women in order to prevent childbed fever. Or Alfred Agner, who suggested that the continents are slowly drifting around the Earth. Or Barry Marshall, who identified that H. pylori, a bacteria, was causing ulcers and not stress or spicy foods. Can we afford to wait. As the architect, 20th century inventor, Buckminster Fuller stated, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank the amazing people behind our work, the students, my collaborators, all of the participants who help us with our research and make this possible for me to be able to share this kind of story with you. There's some amazing local solutions looking at um, local produce and ensuring that we can all get fresh foods. And just to thank uh, the funders, someone had asked me about funding. We never receive any funding from the, the companies that make the products. Um, a lot of our funding actually comes from philanthropic support through the UC Foundation. But we do have some other amazing funders like the Gamma Foundation University, um, the Vic Davis Memorial Trust, the Canterbury Medical Research Foundation, um, et cetera. And we've got donations for our hampers that we give to all mums who participate in our trials. And ultimately, I do get asked this question, which is, which vitamins should I take?
And you need to understand that most of them, or in fact, none of the ones that you probably buy in a supermarket, have ever been studied for, this, for psychiatric symptoms. And so here's all the ones that I know that have been studied. And if you email us, we'll provide you with more information specifically on the research that we've done in our lab, as well as labs around the world. So thank you for your attention. a little bit late and I appreciate that some people may need to go but I am absolutely happy for us to stay and I, for me to answer ask, you know, for you to ask some questions that there are there some roaming mics yes so there's uh, hopefully there'll be some help in in that and um, does anybody have yes question over there Do you wanna, can you just wait for the mic so everyone can hear you I can understand that you use um, supplements effectively pills to, can you hear? Yes. Yeah. The two, you use pills as part of your um, ran, randomized experiments, but have there been any studies done or are, is there a future in looking at studies of using, of actually uh, interventions to improve diet mm -hmm. to, and what studies have been done to, yes. to give the contrast between perhaps multivitamins and, yes. uh, and yeah. diet interventions? Yeah. So I did share a couple of those studies. I showed you the SMILES trial and the Healthy, Healthy Med trial, which were two, which were actually the first ones that were targeted specifically people who were depressed. And they randomized them to me Mediterranean diet versus social support. And they did find that, yes, diet is absolutely is, um, can be important in terms of reducing symptoms associated with psychiatric illness. Um, now, our research, I'm, I'd be, I'm delighted if people take away the message that you should eat just a little bit better. Eat more fruits and vegetables. Eat some kale, Brussels sprouts, that kind of thing. I'd be del absolutely delighted because we can't supplement the world. That's, but what our research does do is it puts it on the map and it, our, our trials are run like drug trials. And so it's hard to argue against research that's been done the way we've done it. And believe me, people want to, to put it down. They want to say there was something wrong with your trial, that it just wasn't powerful enough, or you, you know, the blind wasn't done appropriately, or something. They do. They, they are, they're constantly trying to find what's wrong with the trial so they can ignore it and that we can keep taking our antidepressants, our anxiolytics, and our antipsychotics. So that's why we do the research we do. It's to say nutrition is relevant. You see our research, you cannot argue with it. We've done the level of evidence. You can't argue that nutrition is, the nutrients are irrelevant and important. What we don't know is whether or not diet manipulation alone is, a, is, a, is enough or whether or not some people need more nutrients. And I would absolutely love that study to be done. We haven't done it yet, but it's always on my radar. There's, do I, um, okay, over there, apparently I have to do this. I have to, mo there's one over there. That's going to be hard to get to. Hello. So after your research and your work gets accepted or maybe seen by that government agency, I can't remember the name, the governmental agency, the pharma. Pharmac. pharma uh, so what would that mean for the lab and what would be the next steps? Say that again. What would that mean for? What would be? What What would that mean for the lab and your, and you, the yep. lab and you? If If it got funded. So would that just mean funding, f more funding from no, the government? No, no, no. What the challenge that we've got is that we, we get the nutrients given to us for free, and the plus, a matching placebo is part of our research. The companies we work with um, will give it to any research group for free if they're they've got an ethically approved trial. No strings attached. They have nothing to do with the publication. The challenge is that when people finish our trial and they get well, then at that point they have to pay for it because it's not subsidized by Pharmac. If, you go, if you're put on an antidepressant or a stimulant, that's subsidized by the government. They pay. You only have to pay 3 to $5 to get the script, but otherwise it's free. And so that's our challenge is that you've got people who are getting a, who would get a, a medication for free or they have to pay for their nutrients. So often people will make the decision to just switch to medications. And what we're showing is that when they do that, they don't do as well as if they stayed on the micronutrients. 
So if we got the funding, that wouldn't affect my work in any way whatsoever, but it would mean the people that we've helped can stay on the nutrients and not feel that they, they have to either stop, which happens a lot, or that they end up switching to medications which are free. Thank you. Yes, can you, if you talk loud, because this is going to take for, I wish they had two mics, that would be wonderful. Right. Right. So, yeah. So I personally haven't run a dietary intervention study in my lab. Do you want to bring there's some, there's somebody over there who is ready next? So I haven't done that because we've been busy with the nutrient studies. There is research that's looked at whether or not a vegetarian style diet is good for your mental health, and the overall finding is mixed. There is research that shows meat in moderation. Sorry to the people here who, who that this is just the data. I am just a messenger. Um, that having some meat is, uh, is good for your mental health in, in group populations. So that's what the data show. There's been a, uh, from, my, from my memory is that there's been a meta-analysis that has shown that. So I feel comfortable about saying that. Um, but that doesn't mean, I mean, the thing is, is that we are all biochemically individuals. And some people can do absolutely fine and thrive on a vegan diet, whereas other people get really unhealthy. So we can't just say everybody must eat in a certain way. And that's why I stuck to telling you only about the Mediterranean diet, because that's where there's the most consistent research. So I can confidently say in front of an audience like this that the Mediterranean diet is doing really good things. Um, and that if you were thinking about shifting away from a, a Western diet, the pro processed food diet, then that would probably be a good, a good place to start. Um, my worry for some people who eat a vegan diet, particularly, is deficiencies that can be caused in B12 in particular. But so, as I said, some people can thrive. Somebody over there, who has the mic? Basically, like, as one of the kids who's probably spent a thousand of dollars on snake oil. Sir, I can't hear you and I can't even oh, you, see you. Can you hear me now better? Huh? Can you hear me? Oh, you're you over better? there. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Basically, like, I was wondering, how do you get the basics of diet and exercise to young kids and young adults, like in this day and age? Yes. Because in high school, we're taught the basics of diet, nutrition, and PE class, but a large majority of people at my young age have just spent hundreds of dollars on stuff that simply doesn't work. They're pretty much the business targets for exploitation. So, I was wondering, how can we get like health and fitness and basic diet and normal stuff into the community for cheaper, without people spending billions of dollars or being, you know, snake oil suckers? Yes. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't call them snake oil. I hate the, the term using snake oil supplements because that implies actually that we ha they're no better than placebo. And I've shown you that they are, in many studies, better than placebo. So I, I, I get a little bit um, sensitive to that term. So how are we going to do it? Well, I think, I think there's multiple things that we can do. Why don't we teach children how to cook? Why don't we have vegetable gardens in the, in the schools? Why don't we um, sort of increase our love and interest in community uh, gardens and, uh, and encourage people to eat local produce, foods in season because they're cheaper, and, and really start at that point and getting that as part of our, that's a normal part of our community. So we do need to have a shift in our community and how we perceive food and exercise so that we can really have a fundamental effect across many people. Because again, doing it one to one is just not probably a, a, it's not a, a going to be a, an economical way to go. Yes, you have more. Oh, right. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a, a challenge in any kind of research. Is that, and that's why I. I'm just careful to say that you, you know you need to, if you're going to, if you want to replicate what we've shown, you probably need to use the doses and the nutrients we've used. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. Um, I just noticed when you put the uh, different vitamins and minerals up there, you didn't have B pure. For years, <laughs> I've been going through not knowing, like I'm sure a lot of you do, don't know what to use. You try one, it doesn't work very well. You try something else, something else, something else. I seriously was groveling so, so weak at night. And then I started taking these ones, which have got five, five yeah. tablets, 
for all of the minerals because if you don't have enough, you don't have enough. You've got to take five to get your quota. And in two days, I was a different woman. Yeah. And I am so much younger now. I just can't believe the difference in me. Yes. Okay, and so it's my just like, well, yeah. well, we don't know what to do, where to get it from. Yes. Right? That's why, I mean, we, we are happy to provide the information, so that's why we have, that's why my, the email is up there to find out what we've been using. Now remember that the ones that we're using are dis developed for psychiatric symptoms. They're not for general health. Be Pure is for general health. Um, I mean, Ben Warren, who as you see is my, one of my PhD students, um, would love the advertising that you've just given for his company. Um, but. Uh, we're very, I'm very careful to not put his product up there because his product hasn't been studied for the treatment of psychiatric symptoms. And, and that's, that's why it's not there. If that, if that kind of work had been done, then I would absolutely put that there, but there's no published studies. Um, it's not to say that it's not a good product, it's just to say that um, it hasn't been researched for what we are, treat, we are particularly targeting. Yes? We'll, fi we'll have this can second last question, so we'll have one more. Sorry. Yep. Yes. Correct. Yep. I know. I know. So yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's the challenge. But I, I mean, I, it's, it's a, it, regulation is very important to ensure that there's no toxic ingredients in there, that it's not going to cause harm. Um, but the challenge is, is that if we overregulate this market, you're going to make it so that nutrients are not available to the general public. And that, to me, I think is the wrong approach. Vitamins and minerals are part of our food. To regulate, overregulate it will mean it will be taken out and that it will be put, you will have to go and get a prescription in order to purchase it. So I'm, I'm a little worried about that. But if you've got appropriate regulations, with some, which the government is working on, which is to ensure that it has what it says it has, then that's really good. And so there's the regulations from a few years ago, there was a lot of problems with it. It was eventually it was um, kicked out of, you know, it, it, it didn't go through, but they're working on new legislation again. So how about just one more question and then I think we should stop. Is there any last I question? Yes, back. okay. Yes. Yeah, it's not me who, who report, applies, it's my graduate students, so they, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is a challenge, and that's something we're working on. So what we're trying to do at the moment is develop a list of people who are in, within nationally who can, can do take a holistic approach to and use nutrition in their in their counseling or in their psychotherapy, so that we can know who to refer to people to because we get asked that question a lot. Um, but I think it's only going to be a matter of time. It's just it's a matter of mental health professionals getting educated. Um, psychiatrists, psychologists, getting the knowledge so that they can start using it in their practice. So, is there anyone in the industry who would be? Huh. Public health care system? You, I, I'm sorry, but you're probably not going to get a lot of necessarily nutrition advice from the public health care system. They do have a nutritionist, but they have what one or two for thousands of people. So that's the challenge: is that there's not enough not nutritionists. In public health care system, they don't exist. Yeah, though they do exist in private, but you're going to have to pay for it. Last one, one last, follow, one follow up. but it better be quick. Yeah, very quick. Have you um, researched uh, Dean Ornish's current Medicare coverage for his more holistic approach? No. If you, if you can cite the United States, it may actually work here. Okay. It may backfire. Has Dean Ornish's name a holistic approach through with yeah. the Okay, great. Okay, if you can contact me and email me about that, that would be fantastic so I can know more about it. So thank you for your attention. Sorry to keep you waiting tonight. And I hope it makes a difference.